Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm happy to be here today with uh, Tim, who is, runs our product management uh, team, and we've got Brian Pham, who is a business systems analyst with Exactly. Today we're going to be talking about iPaaS in the enterprise, what to look for in a cloud integration platform. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a, a deep dive demonstration. We're going to be sharing a case study. Um, Brian's going to be sharing with us the story about exactly in the journey uh, to cloud adoption and cloud integration at his company. Um, and as I mentioned, Tim will be diving into uh, an overview of the SnapLogic Elastic Integration Platform. So thanks for joining us. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. So what we're seeing at SnapLogic is there's a new set of enterprise integration challenges. Um, there's often two distinct types of challenges. One, the one side, which we'll be talking about mostly today, has to do with SaaS applications, cloud applications like Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow, making sure these new, these best of breed systems are well integrated with each other as well as integrated with on-premises systems in an orchestrated fashion, in an automated fashion, ensuring that you don't end up with silos of information and an inability to get a single view of your customer, your product, et cetera. Um, the second camp is the analytics side, so data integration, being able to deliver timely, relevant, trustworthy information downstream to your analytics users. Could be your data scientists, uh, your data types could be the new Hadoop, the big data types of systems, but also relational databases and relational data warehouses. So what we're seeing at SnapLogic is uh, this world is coming together and organizations are, are looking for a single platform that can handle multiple styles of integration, that can handle the API proliferation, and then are ready for this, uh, what's coming next, this onslaught of uh, the Internet of Things and all the, the exhaust that, uh, that these systems are, are generating. So a lot of new challenges, and you know, what, what's really starting to happen in the market is there's a new style of integration platform. Gartner and other industry analyst firms are now referring to this as IPaaS, integration platform as a service, which Gardner describes as an emerging cloud-based way for directors of integration to deliver integration platform capabilities. And what we've seen at SnapLogic, we ran a survey earlier in the year and we asked, what's the primary driver for a cloud integration platform? And the number one reason we got back, number one driver was speed, time to value. Too often, the integration layer, the middleware, this, you know, the, the need to connect, it becomes a bottleneck as opposed to an on-ramp to the cloud or an on-ramp to big data and a new um, analytics infrastructure. And what happens is the business doesn't want to wait. They don't want to get in line and be told that it's going to take six months, six weeks to, to get a, you know, do a field mapping. They want to be able to get, go much faster than that. So there's a new breed of technology that's coming online to address that for speed. Flexibility, subscription-based, self-service, these are some of the drivers that we're seeing and the survey also identified as primary uh, reasons organizations are looking to uh, integration platform as a service. So, so who is SnapLogic? We are a, a company that is 100% focused on connecting data applications and APIs in a single platform. Our founder and uh, CEO, Gaurav Dillon, uh, happened to be the co-founder and former CEO of Informatica. He ran that company for 12 years. And his vision is really to deliver this unified platform that significantly speeds up enterprise data access everywhere. You can see some of the uh, logos of companies that are running SnapLogic. And, and really why I wanted to put the snaps in here so you understand uh, the heritage of the name. Um, our, our connectors and the components that we construct in a pipeline we call snaps. And we have over 200 of these SNAPs available, uh, and we have an SDK for customers and partners to build their own SNAPs. And we'll talk a bit more about that later today. So that's what, what we're focused on at SnapLogic. Now, a few use cases before I hand it over to Brian to share, us, uh, share with us his, his story and what, what they're doing it exactly. Um, I just wanted to give you some context on a few of the different use cases where an integration platform is, is becoming a, a critical component. So the first one is fairly obvious, and that's one we'll be talking about today, which is cloud application integration. Here you see a need for you know, event-based, real-time orchestration, um, the ability to, in a synchronized, uh, orchestrated fashion, connect multiple systems. 
uh, we, we sometimes refer to, to it as massively multi-point. This need to not just connect, you know, a point-to-point -point, uh, set of uh, systems, but to have this orchestration across multiple uh, front office, back office, and, and essentially any data source that you, you have in your organization. The second is we're seeing growing need for digital marketing uh, use cases where you might be using something like um, AWS Redshift. Uh, you might be using something like Domo, which they're running at, uh, at exactly. Um, you need to, or, or Tableau, which is quite common. You need to very quickly, as a marketer, be able to measure the effectiveness of your campaign, and you want to go quickly. We're even seeing some of our customers in marketing actually driving the, the push for Hadoop and uh, bringing in big data platforms to serve their uh, analytical requirements. So big data analytics, access, prepare, and deliver. Uh, we have been certified by Hortonworks and Cloudera. So if you are moving towards um, that type of infrastructure, um, we'll talk a bit about that later today. And then increasingly, this need for a self-service enterprise platform that connect, connect to multiple systems. So those are some of the use cases that we're seeing um, our customers talk to us about and, and deploy and, and, and move towards as they rethink their, their data application and API infrastructure. So with that, I want to bring you into the conversation, uh, Brian. So Brian Pham, as I mentioned, is a business systems analyst at Exactly. So, so Brian, uh, Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit about Exactly, a little bit about yourself, and then dive into um, your journey to the cloud. All right, thanks, Darren. Uh, so I've been with the company for a little over four years wearing multiple different hats, starting from implementation to product management and ultimately business applications here. So my job is to allow, the, allow our company to get a competitive advantage by reducing friction. And everything that goes in with that, a uh, big piece of that is integration because we got to get all these applications talking to each other. Um, so a little bit about exactly, we've been a high growth cloud company for over eight years now. A lot of you guys might be our uh, customers, but we are in the incentive compensation management space. So if you guys don't know, we are set to go on this vision to empower every company to incent right. So if you don't know much about incentive compensation, you might be asking yourself, well, what's the big deal? What's the problem? So with that, I'm just going to let you guys in on a little story that I've, I discovered the problem real early. So I was in college, and I was working for a cell phone provider, and during one of my training sessions, I was working with another sales rep, and I witnessed a customer come into the store. Now, he started looking up this customer's information. The customer simply needed to upgrade their phone. So I, I was shadowing and kind of looking at the customer's information. They're eligible for an upgrade, something very common. You guys are doing phone upgrades, things like that. But I saw that the sales rep told the customer that it would be better if they just canceled their line and started a new line. So he went through all that process and he was done with it and the customer left the store. So I had a sidebar conversation with him wondering, well, why, why didn't you just upgrade the customer? They were eligible for an upgrade. And he told me, well, if I upgrade the customer, I get $8. But if I create a new commission plan for them and it's a $100 commission plan uh, or, an, or a plan for their cell phone, I'll get half that commission. So $100 plan, 50 bucks, eight bucks or 50 bucks. So there's a problem with incentives. And I would have known that issue if I was able to get to my results faster, but I didn't really know what was going on with my commission because everybody was calculating that manually in an Excel spreadsheet. So we have a problem with the customer not knowing that they've been scammed, the sales rep not providing the right incentives, and the company thinking that they are putting together a really good commission plan to drive customer loyalty and things like that. So for exactly, we want to automate the right incentives by providing that visibility. We make the system, you don't have to calculate it inside of an Excel spreadsheet, and we inspire performance by giving you that real-time data. It says, okay, well, if you build the right commission plan and you work a little bit harder, you can get this much commission back versus you know, going the wrong route and, and giving the customer uh, a bad experience, and that'll align you with your company goals. So it'll drive the right result. And this translates over to, to why cloud is so important. It gives you that visibility right up front. In order for us to say that we need a cloud solution, that you guys as a customer need our cloud solution not to use your spreadsheets, we had to adopt that 
mindset ourselves. So our infrastructure is primarily cloud-based. Right from the get-go, we were one of the first customers to jump on Workday Financials. Um, then we also jumped into Workday HR for our ERP and uh, HCM. And for our front end, we used Salesforce as the main CRM. And we connected a bunch of other applications like Aptis and Marketo to that to build the entire infrastructure. But we ran into a challenge where we needed to really get these applications connecting. We started seeing silos forming. So the challenge is time to connect CRM in the ERP. From my first day in this role, it was very clear that my boss had a vision uh, to build a system of systems. So this is Bob here, who's uh, my boss, and he's just basically communicated one vision of a single customer view. So what he means by this is we need to be able to reply to our executive team with any question that they have about the customer. When was the last time that customer paid? Okay, how are they doing in terms of uh, customer satisfaction? Do they have any outstanding customer support tickets? Are they adding users? All the details would have to be, we would need to be able to answer that. But the information was scattered. So let me just show you uh, what it looks like when you actually start building up all these applications, start to see silos forming. Aptis, for example, is built on the Force.com platform, Marketo. Um, we integrate really well with Salesforce. Zendesk also works with Salesforce. But Workday Financials, that's, that's totally separate. And we start to see that, well, some of the information that I need about the customer lives in Workday. Some of the information I need lives in Salesforce. And they don't talk to each other. For example, we tackled a new, we're approaching a new project here where our professional services team needed to really streamline their process, and our professional service app was OpenAir, which didn't really sit too close to the CRM or the ERP, so it was kind of just hanging out on its own, so it didn't have any native built-in connectors. And that's where SnapLogic really comes in. Um, first step here is to even leverage the business intelligence that Domo would provide, we need to get all these systems in line. There needs to be IDs going back and forth so that we can identify that this is one data point so that way we can slice and dice it using Domo. Okay, so with the, with the Salesforce to open air integration, what we're doing there is actually allowing us to get ahead of the curve in terms of managing our professional services team. When, when an opportunity inside Salesforce reaches a stage where it's closer to being done, we will then create a project inside of OpenAir so we can plan for that booking. So the initial use case here is to create an OpenAir project. It's really simple with the SNAP. We look at all these opportunities. They are committed. They're likely. We want to make sure that we don't run into any duplicates there. And we want to create different approaches for them. If it's a uh, we have two main products. If it's an incent project, that is an enterprise uh, size effort. So we have to handle that a little bit differently than we would for a small, medium sized uh, company. So there's some logic that we can put in before creating a project. And also, if we don't, if the integration fails and we can't create the project for whatever reason, we want to have a record of that. So there's error logs here and success logs here as well. Um, but going back to the big picture, in order for us to leverage reporting, we needed that system to go back into Salesforce and let us know that the project has been created successfully. So the next pipeline that we had to do was once the project has been created, we needed to go back into Salesforce and update it so that everybody who just primarily lives in Salesforce can know that the project is already created inside of OpenAir. They don't need to go and manage that. And then now we also have that in line. So that is our professional professional service pipeline there. Um, I guess we could talk about what we want to do for the next step. Now that we have professional service automation going, we're going to tackle uh, the quote to cash process. So today we use Salesforce, we use Aptis to create quotes, and we get that information out for what the customer purchased, but we're manually uploading that into Workday Financials. And it'll be easier if we could just 
say, okay, sales rep, you generate the quote, you send it to a customer, they, they sign it, it comes back, we close the opportunity, and all of that information just transfers right over to Workday to send them contract information and billing. So that's the next, that's the next approach. Um, I guess a lot of you are wondering why I didn't use the out-of-the-box Workday and why, why SnapLogic and why not another type of middleware. Well, it really comes down to ease of use, flexibility, and, and the roadmap. SnapLogic actually came from, uh, was founded from people who have been at M Informatica, so they've been in this space for a really long time. And the way that they designed their snaps, it's, it's a flow, and it's very easy to communicate. It wasn't that I, I could just go in and write these scripts because a script doesn't translate very well. It's basically saying in the ETL process, extract, transform, and load, you extract the data, I do something with this huge script, and then I, I load it into this endpoint. So the troubleshooting that we wanted from our IT team wouldn't be, wouldn't be very easy. We wanted it to be at a point where multiple users can just jump in and take a look at what I built and say, okay, I, I see where the flow is going. I know what tweaks I need to make rather than go through and just look at code. And it's 100% cloud. There's a lot of solutions out there that needed to be managed on-prem, and that's, a, that's an issue because we want to be agile. We want to keep moving. If there's an issue, I want to know about it right away. I want to get it on my phone through their mobile app, uh, things like that, managing the pipelines uh, everywhere. Okay, so I think a few of you might be trying to approach integration, and there's a few recommendations that I have, and that's always keep the big picture in mind. So that is our customer 360 vision. That is the lighthouse from the main goal. Answer any question that the executive team could have about the customer. That way we can be really responsive and adapt to it. So if the APIs are not robust enough and these departments are trying to work on an integration, IT should handle it. We should take it in-house and we should uh, use SnapLogic to develop it fully. And the roadmap should always have reporting in mind. So even if you're thinking about a short project like my open air project there to just say, I want a Salesforce opportunity to create an open air project, I still had the idea of putting in an ID in which Workday could reference that project. So it's all about getting everything, uh, getting one main record. And to do that, you need a lot of IDs linking a lot of places, and you need to have that thought on each project that you approach. Uh, the second tip is be agile. I wouldn't let outliers prevent you from integrating. A lot of people will stop when they are trying to approach integration because they can't handle 100% of the use cases, or they get hung up on all these outliers. Well, in this scenario, so-and-so happens, and we don't really know how, how to handle that. I would go with the 80-20 rule, where we, we would be able to automate 80% of your use cases, and the other, the other piece of it you can handle manually. And I guarantee you that will catch on real quick and they will, they will change some process or we will discover a way to get the remaining pieces. But if you just keep getting hung up on all of these outliers, you're never going to get any, any integration going. Um, and also the point of this is to provide a competitive advantage and reduce friction. So that's the approach to all, all integration and everything that we do here on the IT business application side. You don't want to be that, that block. You don't want to slow down. You don't want to police the data. So if the department is comfortable managing lightweight pieces, like sometimes people still use the data loader on the, on the Salesforce side to update records, that's not, that's not for me to come in and stop that process. It's just saying, oh, okay, I see you're using the data loader. Why, what are you doing? Why is it, you know, what is your pain point? And see if you can integrate, provide integration to help free up their time so they're doing more strategic things rather than data entry. Um, and the last step is, or the last recommendation is to collaborate and coordinate. So you might approach integration like a, a normal project where you just go in and you get the requirements, you take it, you think about it, and you go and you build, you build on their specs, but that's not really, that's not really the right approach for, for success. 
you need that constant feedback. You need to go and talk to them and really live in their space. And then as you're building, check in and say, well, here's my plan to kind of move this ID over here. And that way I can flag that something has been created. Just go into a little bit more detail. And it's easier with Snap Logic because you can see that flow. It's very apparent. You don't have to try and explain what this line of code is doing. You just have to explain this, this uh, snap that says map data is moving data across from this field to this field. Things like that become a lot easier when you can explain it visually, and that's what Snap Logic provides. And also, partner with the experts. I wouldn't have been able to do this open air integration, and it was, it was a pretty lightweight integration, but I wouldn't be able to have done it without the help of Snap Logic, simply because there's some weird outlier cases like open air, their API wasn't so robust that way, so they couldn't really reveal the internal IDs that I needed to match. And that was something that I had no idea and I could have been scrambling forever, but a quick question to Snap Logic, and they knew what was the issue. So if you really want to move fast, you can't do it alone. That's a great, um, great overview, Brian. Uh, thank you for taking us through that. Um, one thing I wanted to, to ask you, and this is from the conversations I've had with you and, and Bob over the last few weeks, um, you talk a lot about quick wins and working closely with the business, um, and you shared with me a story about the, the, the person who had been doing fairly manual integrations in your professional services team um, and, you know, and what she's able to do now. Um, can you kind of, was that a win for you? Was that something that, uh, that allowed them to, they saw the value and you could go further? Maybe you could tell us, share with us that example. Okay, so on the professional services side, um, there was a director of operations who had to create every single project manually. And that means any opportunity that gets close to being completed, they would have to go in, create a new, a new project, list out all the phases of the project, assign resources, things like that. It was taking up a lot of time when professional services is quite a challenge itself and can always be optimized. So their efforts, if we freed up their time, it would be much better. So we started talking and we got into patterns and saying, well, every time it's a new customer, they follow this format, this, this project guideline, and I simply wrote the rules to that. Okay, sure, sure there will be some cases where it's unique that it might not fall into a template, but in those cases, I actually routed it that way. So I created the project but with no phases or tasks. That way they can put in that on their own. Um, but it freed up a lot of her time a significant amount of, I think 80% of the projects right now, she doesn't have to create. So whenever she's looking at some different use cases that kind of fall outside of the scope, then we can, then we can even enhance that and uh, approach that as a, a phase two type project. And we're already there. We're discovering that, hey, you know what? If we tweak a couple of these uh, data points here, we can actually create a template for it. So we're gonna reach 90% and Soon after, I think we're, we're easily going to hit 100% of projects being automated through here. Awesome. So start with the 80-20 and then just continue to refine and iterate, and um, that's a great message. Well, so, so thanks for taking us through that, Brian. Uh, stay on because I want to uh, bring you back in for some questions as uh, Tim goes into you know, how Snap, Snap Logic works and, and some of the details. So um, um, thanks for that. And there might be, there's some other questions coming in. We'll, we'll take some of those towards the end. So I wanted to just, I know that many of you on today's uh, call or watching this are not as familiar with Snap Logic, so I thought I would just take you through a brief overview before handing it over to Tim to, to take us through what it all looks like uh, and how it works from a, a demonstration perspective. So there's really three components to the Snap Logic uh, Elastic Integration Platform. Uh, the first is our integration cloud, and that's what you're going to see primarily in the demonstration. That's the end user uh, experience, that's the, the designer, the manager, and the dashboard. Um, it's a cloud-based service, multi-tenant, um, you know, runs, runs uh, you know, through your website, you just log in and every organization gets provisioned um, by SnapLogic and all of our customers are upgraded uh, at the same time. So uh, running on the same um, version of the software, if you will. Uh, the second piece is our execution, which is the, the, what we call the SnapPlex. And that's really uh, a, a real unique aspect of our platform. The SnapPlex is built to scale out. So as you need more capacity, as you need more processing power, um, it will automatically scale out and then can contract back 
based on, on usage requirements. It can run in the cloud. Um, so if it's cloud to cloud, we respect data gravity and you know, everything can run in the cloud. Most uh, often our customers do have a ground plex, which is essentially the snap plex running behind the firewall, connecting to say SAP or Oracle. Um, not every organization has the luxury of starting off in the cloud and, and, and not having anything you know, running on premises. Um, most of the larger organizations we work with uh, have some significant element of their systems um, running behind the firewall. And the Snaplex can also run natively in a Hadoop cluster. So this is fairly new, um, a new uh, capability for the platform to run as a YARN application within a, a Hadoop environment, um, and again, certified by, by Cloudera and Hortonwork. And then the last piece I already mentioned is, are the Snaps and you'll see those in action in Tim's demonstration. So how this all works, and I probably should have made this a build so it's clearer, um, but you'll log in at the top left cloud. You'll be, uh, you'll be doing the design, manage, monitoring um, in the cloud, and then the execution, when you tell a pipeline to run or when it's triggered to run or scheduled to run, it looks for the snapplex that it's associated with. And again, that Snaplex can be you know, in the cloud, it can be behind the firewall, could be in your, your cloud. Um, and that's then doing the heavy lifting and, and data is, is moving bi-directionally between systems. So it doesn't come up and get cached or stored in our cloud. Uh, it's really the heavy lifting is being done by the Snapplex. So it is a streaming architecture, and Tim will talk a bit about that in the demonstration um, and how, how it all works. He'll go through that uh, in a little bit of detail. I mentioned that it can scale out. So these, these are what we call nodes that can expand and contract as usage is, uh, is needed. And in the big data side, we, we make a, a big deal about our big data capabilities because we really feel there's a unique aspect to the, our platform in that we can handle both app integration and some of the orchestration, you know, real-time synchronization, as well as more of the ETL or ELT requirements uh, extraction, load, uh, transformation in terms of being able to acquire, prepare, and deliver data. So how that works is that the, the Snapplex would actually be running as a YARN application, and we have the ability for our pipelines um, to generate MapReduce behind the scenes. So you simply uh, SnapReduce enable a pipeline, it'll bring up only the snaps that make sense, uh, for that type of a pipeline, and then behind the scenes, tra tra transparently to the users, MapReduce code is being generated and it's you know, scaling out across multiple nodes in a Hadoop cluster. So some pretty powerful capabilities if you are moving to a, a big data infrastructure. So that's a bit of an overview. So let me bring you into this, Tim, to switch gears, take us out of PowerPoint, and um, dive into a SnapLogic demonstration. Great, thanks, Darren. Um, so let me switch into our platform here. And uh, as mentioned, I, um, I'm on the product team here and, and uh, we um, are just taking feedback from, from, the, from the field and from um, just what the landscape looks like. And uh, as Darren mentioned, um, the control designer administration monitoring is, is in the cloud. That's the multi-tenant piece. Execution, uh, we have various um, options. So we have, uh, you know, you can post your execution behind the firewall or you can have it in the cloud. Um, so we, we tailored to all the uh, different scenarios that you're looking for, you know, if you're looking for an integration platform, you know the complexities and challenges uh, of, of a mixed infrastructure and, and so we, we design and, and cater to that uh, with our solution here. So what you're looking at here is the designer aspect and then w within designer we also have uh, the manager and dashboard. Uh, we'll dig into that. Um, but on the left-hand side, there's a panel here for snaps, and um, as, as Bryant mentioned, within exactly, they're, they're doing some open-air stuff. Uh, they're working with Workday, going to be kicking that project off. And, and so um, you can see the entire list of, of snaps that, we ha that were published to within this particular organization. Um, and, um, of course, the, the typical uh, SAP uh, uh, Relative Oracle MySQL uh, connections. And in mentioning the, the big data, um, we, we have the support for the H HDFS reader and writer. And so this is where you will uh, acquire your big data um, and land it into uh, your Hadoop uh, infrastructure. And 
uh, as Darren mentioned, we, we run um, natively on Hadoop, and so once you bring that data in, um, and then the execution layer would, would, scan, would span off uh, MapReduce jobs, um, and then you're only moving the data uh, into your Hadoop, so you don't have to do two hops for those of you interested in uh, the big data side of things. So Bryant mentioned um, that uh, within their organization, he was giving us different examples, and, and thank you for that. They're super insightful. And um, just to want to dig into another example here, and here's uh, an app um, integration example. And so what we're doing here is we're taking Salesforce opportunities, uh, as you can see, doing various transformations and additional lookups, and uh, uh, essentially, eventually going to SAP to do a BAP, BAP B create. Um, so we're creating orders, doing some auditing, um, sending that data to, uh, to RELTIO at the end of it to do some uh, insights, get some insights on your, your data and what's going on there. So this is a, 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 a larger uh, application integration scenario. just wanted to highlight taking Salesforce, sending that to SAP and RELTIO. Um, and just to show you a little bit of how the platform itself works, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll build a simple pipeline, and the scenario that I'm taking here is I'm going to be taking data from uh, Oracle. And as you can see, once I, I drag the uh, Oracle Snap onto the canvas, I'm going to select a uh, an account here. And then within this Oracle um, account, I'm going to select the schema, and um, I'll select Sales Admin here, and then I'll select the table. And so as you can see, once you have your account set up and you, uh, you're going through this uh, process, it's, it's configurable, there's, there's you know, suggestible bubbles that help you um, pick uh, the, the data and the, the table name that you need to select. And what we're going to do in this scenario is we're going to actually join this data um, with, uh, with our accounts. Because if you look at the Oracle Select, and I'll, I'll go ahead and preview the data by clicking on this uh, darker shade here. There's, a, there's some customer IDs here, um, but they're in numeric form. I don't really know what they mean. And uh, we're looking at log data here. There's different log levels. There's event times, event types. Um, so this is, this is uh, if we're evaluating our, our, our big data set of logs that we've collected and gathered, um, we want to get a little bit more insight. So we're, gonna, we're going to actually join that uh, customer data with, uh, with the actual customer name preview of the actual file. So you can see the uh, IDs here with the corresponding uh, names that we have associated. And we'll just take that and we'll build out the rest of the flow here. And so um, I'm just going to do a CSV parser. And then I'll sort the data. So as you can see, I'm just adding snaps to the canvas. Um, and then in drag and drop fashion, in configuration, um, you can see that this snap turned red and say, hey, you know, you're actually missing a property. So I'll click on add, add a row. And then at this point, I'll just pick the customer ID. And then from here, we'll actually join the data. And for those of you that are, that are doing um, integration or, or big data work, you'll know how important it is to join your, your sources, um, you have sources, uh, multiple sources, and you're trying to get better insights into the actual data that you, that you need to view, leverage, and utilize. And so um, we'll join the data here based on the customer ID. And then after that, we're going to send this data into Redshift. So we'll do Redshift bulk load. Um, and so one thing about our snaps is that we, um, let me make sure I have the right account here. So one thing about our snaps is that we, uh, we really tailor them to leverage the best practices of the endpoint. And so for this Redshift bulk load, we're uh, obviously doing the S3 load and then copy into uh, Redshift. And then um, there's the option to just create the table if not present. And so we'll do what, webinar 1038 is the time. And so this will create the table uh, when I execute this. And um, you know, with, within a few minutes, I've, I have this flow now, and I can take data from two sources, join them, and send them to Redshift, 
and then I and then from there I can get a lot a good insight into my data. And so we'll just limit this to I think that's one million here. Um, we'll save. And then I'll go ahead and kick off this pipeline. So this will take maybe two to three minutes to run. Um, and while it's running, I want to show you that um, within SnapLogic itself, uh, we represent data uh, in JSON format natively. Um, uh, the example here isn't too interesting since it's flat, but it would show the hierarchy. Um, and, and obviously, since we have that, that metadata, we can do a lot of different interesting things with it. Um, but we'll we'll let this execute and uh, and later on we'll just hop into Redshift really briefly just to to show you uh, the successful joining of the data um, and then uh, at this time I'm going to switch to a, another pipeline um, and let me just show you by clicking on this plus button this will add an actual pipeline and Darren was talking about SnapReduce and so just want to touch on that briefly but you can create a pipeline that um, that is Consider SnapReduce, and what that will do is um, for the uh, snaps that support the SnapReduce and obviously kicking off the, the MapReduce jobs, uh, we have different snaps here. And so we have the H we have the different file formats, the HDFS reader writer, um, the RC files, um, and so we, uh, this, the sequence format, and so we, we support these different formats. And as you can see um, here, uh, this is, so w the pipeline that you're looking at now is after the acquiring phase. So the, so the data has already been acquired into your Hadoop um, infrastructure, and it's sitting in, in Hadoop. And at this point, you want to do some, uh, you know, some transformation, some aggregating. Um, you want to do something with the data. And this is where we leverage the, uh, the, the, the power of just, just running natively on Hadoop. So um, by running this pipeline, it'll kick off the MapReduce jobs, and it'll fan across however many nodes your Hadoop has. And I'll go ahead and start executing this. And when we look at the runtime statistics here, um, this will uh, update. And at the bottom, it'll give us the SnapReduce statistics. It'll show us uh, how many nodes that it's spanning across. And as you can see, it's uh, doing the initialization and things are getting set up. And for this particular uh, Hadoop, we have um, 32 nodes, and so you'll see the, the tasks, um, the mapping task and the reduce task, and it's representative of the number of nodes that actually exist on that Hadoop system. So after you've done all the transformation, um, you would, uh, if you wanted to send that data out of Hadoop, you would then uh, send it uh, in, in a different pipeline. So that's just how you would do the, the Hadoop flows, and it'll tell you the progress. So um, it just, one point I wanted to bring up here is you've got the, the SnapLex at the top uh, pointing to Hadoop, indicating that in this case, it's actually running, the SnapLex is, is a Hadoopplex, as you call it, so it's essentially the SnapLex running as a Yarn application. Um, can you talk about that and how easy it is to change where that um, SnapLex could be? Because the pipeline is essentially looking for the, the SnapLex uh, that it's associated with. Yeah, it's a great, great point. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, your enterprise will have uh, uh, usually a mixed infrastructure, and so you'll have, you know, this this is running in Hadoop, and let's just say that in my um, in my prior pipeline, uh, I was running on a different SNAP site here, represented in this dropdown, and so this one is running in the cloud. Um, I can certainly select something that's running uh, within the firewall. Um, so your, your SnapLexes can really be anywhere. They can be in, in the cloud, uh, behind the firewall. It can be a Hadoopplex. Um, and, and we, uh, with the click of a button, can, can select the runtime location. So we have uh, tremendous flexibility in, in how we operate that way. And are you going to talk about, so building and running these manually is one thing, but also the, the scheduling, the triggering, uh, yep. those aspects? Absolutely. So we'll hop into to Manager now. Um, and I just opened that into a new tab. And I'll go ahead and switch into the development portion. And so what you're looking at here is within, and let me just scroll down to my particular project here, Tim Louie project. And within here, I have different tasks. And so this is where the scheduling um, takes place. We are under the management section of the 
uh, product and I can go ahead and create a new task. And at this point, I have the option to select the particular pipeline that I'm using. Um, I can select a SnapPlex that I, that I want to use. Um, and then here I can select if I want it to be triggered. So for all of your, uh, all, all of you uh, integrators looking for event-based uh, scenarios, uh, you'll, you'll set up the triggered pipelines here. And then for the scheduled um, pipelines, if you want to schedule them every uh, 5, 10, 20 minutes, depending on what, you know, the endpoints, or if you want to do a nightly batch job or, or, or a daily load, you would schedule it here. And then obviously we offer different um, debugging options if it's if it's triggered, um, so you can uh, know if you know whatever API sending or whatever system sending it to you is sending the correct data. So that's the scheduling piece of it, and then from the monitoring perspective, I'll just switch to dashboards. It's a good time. And there's a question about um, endpoint performance and just general monitoring. How does that work? Um, sorry, what was the, is it just a question? Just the monitoring, just there's a question about how do you monitor the performance of the system. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, perfect, perfect timing. So right here you can, um, you know, obviously if you're, if you're running integrations, you want to know, um, you know, am I running, out of, am I, how, how are my nodes performing? Um, here we give you a snapshot into your CPU memory usage. Um, you can look at a particular point in time and say, you know, maybe this nightly, nightly batch flow took a, a really long time, and so you, you can get some insights there. So you can see the, the health of the various snap plexes and the nodes within it. And then with our pipeline runtime history, uh, obviously I can search by myself and you'll see the snap plex uh, pipeline name. It ran on Hadoop. This other pipeline I created and ran ran on Cloud Dev, and, and they completed with a million documents. Um, and so that's just a, a, a brief overview. I just want to tie it off with just connecting to Redshift and to, to you know, prove that we, we did load data. Um, and I think I changed the name to Webinar 1038. I'll just limit by the top 100 rows. And so we did successfully join the data um, from uh, Oracle with uh, our CSV file that had the accounts with the, with, that matched the corresponding IDs. Great. Um, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation, uh, Brian. Um, you mentioned in, in your presentation it took about two weeks to go live with your professional services integration. What about training? Um, what can you talk, say about your, the skills you had prior to using SnapLogic and your, experiencing, your experience learning SnapLogic um, as a new user? Yeah, so prior to using SnapLogic, I was using Informatica Cloud. Um, I was helping integrate some systems for commission purposes, for uh, being part of the implementation team. So pretty lightweight ETL type stuff. I was able to export things from Salesforce, um, do a little bit of transformation and load it in. But that, that was about as much as experience as I had with integration. Um, when I took on SnapLogic, I liked the way that it was broken out into key pieces so I can easily understand, okay, well, I kind of want to do I kind of want to get data, I kind of want to rearrange them, I kind of want to merge them together so that way I can have one, one record, and I kind of just take that and upload it. The way that it was broken out into individual snaps it really helps, under, helps you understand what's happening rather than trying to figure out a big block of code. You know, it, it's easier to communicate as well. So during those two weeks, I'd say I, I, I ramped on to the product really quickly. Great. Um, yeah, that's helpful. There's another question that's come in, Tim, about versions of pipelines. Sure. Uh, and then how, you know, is it possible to, to actually document these pipelines so that they're able to be uh, shared with others? Or um, it might also be good to talk about patterns. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, first part was versions. So certainly you can version an, any particular uh, pipeline, you'll take a snapshot at any given point in time. Um, from there, you can uh, roll back to that version. Um, it, that's just the high level. Uh, we actually have like a current instance, and then based on the version, we'll replace the current instance. But that, that's um, generally how that works. Um, from a um, patterns perspective, and Brian was talking about patterns, um, you can make any um, pipeline a pattern. 
And so within the patterns here, we have different, um, obviously the different loaders and, and Twitter to Redshift. And so uh, within patterns, you, you create these uh, templates, and then from there you can have uh, the required fields blanked out, and this wizard will take you through it. So in terms of really automating that and systemizing it and, and making it I'm sure there's interest in just documentation and pipeline documentation, and so we try to um, make that a little bit easier for you. And so you can take any pipeline and document it, and you'll get the configurations that are there, um, and you'll get them listed, and you can print them, you can um, archive them, check them into some some version, and if you need to, uh, if you need an audit or or um, your versioning should take care of what you need, but the documentation will help you. Uh, have a copy of that outside of the platform itself, and you can print that and save it somewhere else. Okay, great. Another question has come in around um, moving from development to test to production. Um, can you talk about that and how, how that's handled in StatLogic? Yeah, so we have uh, we have what we call uh, phases or lifecycle management, and from, um, from a, a pipeline lifecycle perspective, you'll create um, these, uh, these pipelines and flows within your development and then from there, you'll, you'll promote them to QA. And um, from there, you'll promote what's in QA to, to prod. And so uh, within each promotion, obviously, there's versions. Um, and then you, you'll want to switch your uh, accounts pointing from your dev system to your QA systems to your prod systems. And then just the ability to go back to your previous version, uh, make changes to that pipeline, and then, and then re-promote it to, to, to QA and prod when you need to. Um, so we do have that, uh, we have that, that feature, um, and just really ha be happy. It, it is a complicated uh, feature, and just anytime you're talking about uh, life cycle uh, or, or, or code cycle or pipeline uh, life cycle, uh, it's pretty complicated, and so just be happy to uh, set up a, a separate, um, just kind of walk through with, with anybody that's interested. Okay, great. Um, and last question I wanted to uh, bring over to you, Brian, and we'll just switch back to the, um, the presentation. It has a... Um, a, a next step slide uh, and discussion slide. So what were you doing before you brought in an integration platform as a service, uh, before you brought in SnapLogic? Were you doing mostly, you know, hand coding? You mentioned other tools. I mean, what was life like um, before you brought in a platform? Oh, it was a lot of exporting of reports, formatting CSVs, and using data loaders from various different applications. I would like to say that, you know, you wish that all of them were as easy as loading data into Salesforce, but it gets more, much more complex when you're talking about workday information and things like that. They have certain templates that you have to abide by, so it's just kind of keeping a lot of templates in line. Um, really painful process, really, because mm -hmm. you don't get the data until you load it and then you wait for it to refresh, but with an integration, you just, I don't even look at it. I don't even have to export any reports. I just have to maintain the error logs. If anything comes over and it's, and it's wrong, I, I'll know about it right away. I just have it scheduled to run at 2 a.m. at night. Um, even that, I, I'm thinking about moving towards having it trigger-based where, when, in, uh, for example, on the Opportunity Project, when that stage flips, I can actually just write a workflow to send out the trigger. And I just need that, that link, and SnapLogic will be able to say, okay, well, I got, I got a feed that says start the pipeline. So it's pretty easy to get on a even more aggressive uh, time schedule. And you guys mentioned this sort of hub and spoke model um, with SnapLogic sort of facilitating all these integrations. Are you measuring, uh, you, know, you know, time savings, cost savings? Is that something that you're going to be kind of quantifying or, you know, showing the business that return? Uh, how, how do you think about that at exactly? payback yeah so the first the first piece is going to be pretty easy for the open air uh, section because since all the projects are are logged by um, an open air uh, by a person just focusing in on open air they can easily communicate back okay well I was using this much time uploading projects and now I don't use that time at all it just kind of comes in 2 a.m. Uh, every day so for each project, there is like a before and after, just 
let's take a look at how, how much time you're spending right now, and then let's take a look after we've gone live to see what's the difference. And then, again, agile development. Okay, we still have you spending a couple hours a week. What can we do there? And just tweak the pipeline a little bit to accommodate more use cases and more use cases until it's ultimately uh, virtually no time. Awesome. Great. Well, that um, I mean, really want to thank you, uh, Brian Pham, for taking us through you know the, the sort of before and after and future strategy of, of integration and exactly. I mean, you guys are really doing some cutting edge stuff. Uh, you know, cloud centric company and a high growth uh, in a high growth market. And so, congratulations on all of your company success and uh, some of your recent successes with uh, with the integration projects. And thanks again for, uh, for for taking us through that today in today's presentation. Um, and also want to thank you, Tim, for uh, for a pretty cool SnapLogic demonstration. Um, so, so I'll give you the last word, Brian. Any any you know final thoughts for people who are just on this integration journey? Put you on the spot here. <laughs> uh, you just got to get started. We've been we've been going back and forth, looking at a whole bunch of different vendors, um, trying to make sure that oh, if we get the data correct over here, get the data correct over there. You just got to start. You know, just go in, build your first pipeline. And that 80-20 rule really applies. I mean, if I, if I told somebody that, hey, every time that you come home, I'd have, you know, food prepared and laundry done and things like that, except for one day. They're, when that one day hits, they're going to wish that this was also automated. So you got to kind of introduce them to, the, to that process. I know they're pretty resistant to change. All of these departments kind of are – used to doing things a certain way, they understand it. When you're saying integration, it kind of scares them. So approach it in that way. Understand that it's going to be a, a change for them, but they will appreciate it once it's live. And they're going to ask for more. <laughs> awesome. I love it. So uh, don't wait to integrate. Don't fear change. And automate, automate, automate. It sounds like uh, definitely some good advice uh, in this area. So thanks again for, for sharing that with us. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And um, we look forward to uh, staying connected and helping you stay connected um, you know, for the rest of this year and into the next uh, few years with SnapLogic. So that ends today's presentation.